anything. I've been given instruction, turn it off because it helps with the screen. But good morning, everybody. It is great to see everyone here this morning. Uh, we have a good crowd. I know I've already had an opportunity to meet several uh, family members that are here visiting different family uh, connections, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, I get to kind of mention one for our family this morning. I know I had said maybe a few weeks ago that our middle daughter Ashley was coming home. Well, she's here, uh, so she's sitting up on the front row, so a little bit bigger smile on Susan's face and my face. She brought her boyfriend home with her. I can't believe I actually got that out. And uh, <laughs> wow, that's the best I've done all week. His name is Logan, uh, and he's here. He's actually flying back home this afternoon to be with his family for the holidays, so keep him in your prayers. I am going to mention one visitor that I met this morning because it's always fascinating just how small the world can be. Uh, so we have a family visiting with us this morning, and the wife was actually the elementary school principal of the school that Sydney and Ashley attended when they were in fourth and second grade. So how do you like that? You guys better pay attention because if you don't, you're going to the principal, all right? <laughs> so uh, it's kind of neat. It's always amazing the connections you can make and uh, how small the world can be when you start talking to folks. So this coming Saturday is obviously Christmas Day, and it is the day that many people uh, in the world would pause and celebrate the birth of Christ. And you know, I think it's good. I'm always a fan of anything that gets people focused more on Jesus. That's a blessing because that's exactly what we want people to do, is to focus on Jesus. You know, when you really dig into Scripture, though, it's kind of interesting when you start looking at the birth of Jesus. There's really not a lot of detail given to us. In fact, only two of the four Gospels, Matthew and Luke, would even record the birth of Jesus. Uh, Mark and John don't mention anything about it. And then if you were to look even further at just the verses that describe the details surrounding the birth of Christ, and if you were to look at those verses compared to all the verses that make up the Gospels, it's really not much detail provided for us. The bulk of the gospel accounts focus on his ministry and, more importantly, his death, burial, and resurrection. But even though there may not be a lot of information left for us, the birth of Jesus is important. And it's worthy of our study, even together this morning, as we think about the events maybe that the world will consider through the rest of this week. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. And I want us to think about some men that are described for us that play a role in the birth of Jesus. They appear on the pages of Scripture, but for just a moment, and then vanish away. Some versions refer to them as wise men. Some refer to them as magi. That word magi is where we get the English word magic or magician. And we might think of magic in terms of sleight of hand or um, some type of illusion that portrays something, but that's really not what the word meant in terms of magi and how they were viewed in Scripture. You see, they were really primarily viewed as seekers of truth. That's what they were. They had a special emphasis on science and specifically astrology and the study of stars. And Matthew chapter 2 is not the first mention of wise men or magi. If you're familiar at all with the book of Esther, uh, when the king wanted to bring the queen Vesta out, he was drunk and he wanted to um, make her parade around so that people could see her beauty and she refused to. One of the things that he did was he called the wise men as a part of his council to ask them some questions. Or maybe you remember King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. And as he had his dreams, and he summons different groups together uh, to try to interpret those dreams, and part of that group was made up of magi, or wise men. And if you're familiar, of course, he didn't give them the details. He just wanted them to interpret the dream and tell them what it meant, and they couldn't do that, and he ordered them to be put to death. So you see, these wise men were seekers of truth, and they were, they were known for their study of the stars. And they played a role, not just here, but in other parts of Scripture. What can you and I, though, learn from these wise men and from the account here that we have in Matthew chapter 2 as we think about our study together this morning? Let's start just by reading Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. 
When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. When we think about these wise men, what are some things that you and I should notice that might be important in terms of our faith or our lives today? The first thing I think is this. These wise men, they sought Jesus. You know, we don't really know a lot about them, but we know just by way of observation from the Scripture that they were persistent in terms of their search and that no sacrifice was too great for them. All we know is that they came from the east. We don't know specifically where. It's been uh, speculated that maybe they came from the region of Mes Mesopotamia or maybe Babylonia or maybe Persia. And the truth is, we just don't know. We're not given specific information here in the context that tells us exactly where, but we can assume that they traveled somewhere on the low end around 100 miles, maybe perhaps up to four or 500 miles. That type of journey would have taken them, if they had camels, maybe two weeks, three weeks, if they were on foot, maybe a month or more. You see, nothing was gonna stop them from doing what they needed to do, what they thought was important, what they were seeking. And they were persistent. They, they traveled on this long journey and they went to Jerusalem because they were searching for a king. And where would this king be? They would think, obviously, the capital city, Jerusalem. Now, we don't know specifically whether these wise men were Jews or Gentiles. Again, we're just not told. If they were Jews, it's possible because the Jews were dispersed or scattered throughout many different regions. And if they were Jews, maybe they were a little bit acquainted with the Old Testament scriptures and prophecies. But if they were Gentiles, this makes this even more interesting, doesn't it? Because they wouldn't have had some of that Old Testament knowledge that the Jews would have had. But yet they were on this journey and they knew what they were seeking. You notice what they told Herod? We only have just a few words recorded that they actually spoke. They said to Herod, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The only words we actually have recorded that they even spoke. You see, they, they saw this star. And again, they were studiers of, uh, of astrology. And we'll talk more about the star here in just a moment. But they knew what they were seeking. And the, the wording that they used here indicates specifically that he was born a king, that Jesus was born a king, not born to be king. You see, those are two very different things. They recognized that he was already a king, and they were determined to find this king. So they were persistent, no sacrifice was too great, and they knew what they were seeking, but yet there was still some uncertainty about their journey, wasn't there? They followed this star, they went to Jerusalem, they seemed to be seeking throughout Jerusalem when Herod summons them to him, but yet there was just some things they didn't know or understand. We think about our lives today. God is looking for people that will seek Him, isn't He? I think about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. As Jesus is preaching to this group of people, many of whom struggled literally with the necessities of day-to-day -day life, with food and clothing and shelter. 
So you see, they had anxiety about these things. They worried. And Jesus is teaching them a lesson about not worrying. And then in verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6, he would tell them to seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things would be added to them. That their, their time and their energy and their worry should not go towards things that God was going to provide for those that he cared about. That what they needed to spend their energy doing was seeking first the kingdom of God. That word kingdom of God is a phrase that Matthew uses many times throughout his gospel. And I believe it does have implication in terms of the church and in terms of the kingdom, but it's much broader than that as well. Ultimately, it has to do with the rule and the sovereignty of God and of Christ in a person's life. But I think about even the Hebrews writer. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, he would say, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You see, God wants people that are seeking after him. That, that feel like no sacrifice is too great. I'm going to imagine that as I look out on this audience this morning, some of you have sacrificed a lot in your search for Christ, in your journey of faith. There have been things that you have sacrificed that I might not even be able to comprehend. Maybe for some of you it costs family relationships. Maybe it costs jobs or job opportunities could have cost any number of things, but you see, that's exactly what God is looking for out of us in our lives today. No sacrifice too great. Be persistent in our pursuit of Christ. You think about what led these wise men in their search for Jesus. It was this star, star that we don't know much about. And we think about our lives and what leads us, what we should follow. I think about the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 12. Immediately following this great chapter on examples of faith, would say in chapter 12 and verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, these wise men, they were searching for the king, for King Jesus. You and I have the ability to look back. We can look back and see the fulfillment of everything that Jesus was and is and did for you and for me. And so as we think about our journey, and our journey has many twists and turns, doesn't it? Our journey of faith is, at times, somewhat like a roller coaster. It can have extreme highs, and it can also have extreme lows and struggles. And as much as we are searching to know Christ better, and it really doesn't matter how long we've been engaged in this search for Christ, every one of us here this morning should still be searching. We never get to the point where we arrive in our knowledge and understanding of Jesus and who He is and what He means to us in our lives. And so we don't have to look for guidance from a star in terms of how we live and how we seek after God. We look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Peter would tell us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 that He's the example that we are to follow. So you see, God still is looking for those that would seek after Him. And we can learn from these wise men in how they sought Jesus. And we need to seek Him as diligently, even more so, than how they did. But in addition to this, we see that not only did they seek Him, but they ultimately found Jesus too, didn't they? And in order to find Him, they followed the evidence, the star. We mentioned it just a moment ago. There's a lot of things I would like to know about this star. What is it? Where did it come from? How did they know to follow it? And there's been a lot of speculation throughout history. There are some that think maybe it was Halley's Comet or some that think it was the formation of a new star and because they had been studying stars and were experts in stars that they knew these things and knew it signified something great. The truth is we just don't know. But I believe personally with all my heart that God obviously played a role 
and them following that star and knowing to the level of detail they did what it meant and where to go. But it wasn't just the star when they got to Jerusalem. Do you notice what the scribes and the chief priests did when Herod called them? And Herod inquires of them, where is this Christ to be born? What do they do? They go back to the Old Testament scriptures, don't they? They go back to the prophet Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they had evidence of the star, but then once they get to Jerusalem, they have evidence from the Old Testament scriptures too. And again, we don't know for sure whether these wise men were Jews or Gentiles. I, I kind of tend personally to think maybe they were Gentiles, but we just don't know for sure. But they had evidence that was presented to them. But here's what's important. Once they had the evidence, they followed it. They followed the evidence that God gave to them, whether it was the star whether it was the revelation of the Old Testament scripture that the scribes and the chief priests pointed Herod to, they followed that evidence to the conclusion that would ultimately lead them to Jesus. And you notice how they reacted when they found him, verse number 10. When they saw the star, they, re they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child. They followed the evidence that led them ultimately to Jesus. And their response to that evidence and to the destination that it led them to was incredible joy in their lives. Think about us in our lives today. You know, God has left what is often referred to as two different kinds of revelation. One is called general revelation, and if you want, just turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, Paul would describe what is often referred to as this general revelation. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You see, God, when He created man, He put something within mankind that causes us to search for something greater than ourselves. But it's possible that we can suppress that truth that God has put in us. But then notice verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. How? Verse 20. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been, have been made so that they are without excuse. You see, that's general revelation. God puts something inside of us as individuals that causes us to seek for something greater or beyond us. But what do we seek for? But you see, God left evidence. In the same way that these wise men had give, were given evidence to them that they could follow, God has left evidence for you and for me so that we can find Him and know Him. And that first place where the evidence starts is actually not in Scripture. You think about someone, I was talking with someone Wednesday night about this. You think about an individual that doesn't believe in God or doesn't believe in the Word of God. You can't start here to prove that God exists. You can't use the Bible to prove that the Bible is true. It's a circular argument. And God knows that. And in His wisdom, He left evidence outside of Scripture that should cause us to ultimately come here to our final destination. But part of that evidence is the incredible process of creation. You think about the human body. You think about the solar system and the world. And when you look at those things and you study them deeply, it, it leads you to the logical conclusion that there has to be something beyond ourselves that was the architect and designer and creator of all these things. And as an individual learns that, they move from general revelation then to what we might call specific revelation, which is the Scripture. And in a sense, that's exactly what happened with the wise men, wasn't it? They followed the star. 
again, we don't know a lot about the details, but we might call that general revelation. It was a part of the creation. It was a part of the universe. But once they got to Jerusalem and stood before Herod, where did the scribes and the chief priests go? To Scripture, the specific revelation. Think about Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And many times we'll quote verses 16 and 17, but look at verses 14 and 15. But as for you, Paul's talking to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from a child or how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I want you to think about Timothy with me for just a moment. Timothy had miraculous ability that had been given to him by Paul. He had special things that you and I don't have access to. But what does Paul tell him to go back to? The sacred writings, those Old Testament scriptures that he had known from childhood that his mother and his grandmother had taught to him. Why? Because those were the things that were able to make him wise to salvation. Paul would say, you think about our lives as we are given evidence. Our response is to follow the evidence, to follow where it leads us. You see, God was purposeful in how he created the world and the evidence that he left for us to lead us to Jesus. And man, when we find him, we need to rejoice and be exceedingly glad and recognize him ultimately for who he is in the same way that these wise men did. You see, they sought him, they found him, and then ultimately they worshiped him. They fell down and worshiped Jesus. The word for worship that's found here in Matthew chapter two is a Greek word, proskuneo. And it's a fascinating word because of the word picture of what it means. It literally means to fall down and blow a kiss. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? to think about that posture, that response to Jesus. You think about these wise men. They knew there was something different about Jesus. They had stood before a king not long before they found Jesus, hadn't they? They stood before King Herod, but we don't read anything of them falling down and worshiping King Herod, do we? But we see them falling down and worshiping Jesus. They understood that he was different, that he was deity, because only deity is worthy of worship. So they fell down. They recognized him as one that had a position of greater honor than they possessed. And they, in essence, blew him a kiss through their worship to him. But they didn't just worship him. They offered gifts to him. Gold, a gift fit for a king. Frankincense, which was used as incense, a gift fit for a priest. And then myrrh, which was more commonly used for embalming, a gift fit for a savior. Jesus, king, priest, savior. The gifts were what they had. They were small, they were easily packed, they could be transported a long way. But they recognized Jesus, they worshiped him, they gave the gifts that they had brought to him. Think about our lives. What should our response to Jesus be? We search for him, we seek after him, and we find him. How should we view him, and what should our response be? They worshiped him as king, an important role that Jesus has and should have in our lives. You see, king means one that rules or has authority over. And it's easy sometimes to recognize Jesus as Savior. It's a little more difficult sometimes to recognize him as king and Lord of our lives. Because that means giving up total control and giving it to him. And we think about our response to a king in the same way that these wise men worshipped him. That should be our response to him as well. Worship. I think about Romans chapter 12. We spent a little bit of time there in our Bible class this morning. And, and you think about as Paul brings this letter kind of to its practical conclusion about what it looks like in terms of daily living. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, where does Paul start in terms of practical application of the book of Romans? He says, you make your life this living sacrifice. Because you see, that is ultimately what your spiritual worship or service is. Worship ultimately starts with us giving our lives to God. Completely giving our lives to Christ. But then it also requires sacrifice out of us in terms of what we give. It starts in that way, but it requires more. I think about Luke chapter 24 and the parable of the widow and her mites. She gave what she had. She gave sacrificially. And her gift was viewed of more value than those who gave quantitatively much more. I think about David in 2 Samuel chapter 24 as he had taken the census that God disapproved of and God's wrath was against David. At the end of the chapter, David recognizes his sin and he wants to offer sacrifice to God and he's looking for a threshing floor in order that he can build an altar. And we read of an individual who's willing to give him that threshing floor, but what does David say? He says, I'm not going to sacrifice something to God that costs me nothing. You see, our worship should cost us something. It should take something of us emotionally and physically. And as we worship God, we sacrifice ourselves. And it costs us something. Why? Because He's worthy of that sacrifice. He is King. He is Priest. He is Savior. And He's worthy of our worship and our response to Him. You know, these wise men... These magi, they're interesting. They appear on the pages of Scripture, but for a moment, and then they disappear back to their own country. And we don't even know exactly where they came from. We don't know how many of them there were. We don't know whether they were Jews or Gentiles, but we know this. We know they sought Jesus with everything they had. We know they found Jesus through the evidence that had been left for them. And when they found Him, they worshipped Him as the king and priest and savior that he was. So the question that's left for you and me this morning is this. Are we as wise as they are? Are we wise enough to be willing to seek Jesus no matter what the obstacles are, no matter what the sacrifice might be? Are we persistent enough in our lives to seek after Jesus? And then when we find him, are we willing to recognize Him for who He is? Will we, will we recognize Him as King of our lives? As the priest, the high priest that intercedes on our behalf, as the Savior that paid the price on the cross to wash away our sins? And will we sacrifice our life in response in worship to Him? That begins by giving our life to Him, by changing the way that we live to follow Him, by being united with Him in baptism. If you've never done that, we'd love to help you with that this morning. There's no greater response to Jesus and His sacrifice on the cross than by being joined to His death, burial, and resurrection and baptism and then living a life that's dedicated to Him forever. Maybe you're here and you're struggling in your walk of faith. We're here as a church family to help you in any way that we can. We'll pray with you. We'll put our arms around you. We'll be that hugging congregation that Travis described. Whatever we can do to encourage you, we want to do it this morning. Just let us know how we can help you while together we stand and sing.